so I put up on the board over there a reference. I think essentially everything I covered in the first part is also covered in a nice uh, survey paper by Etienne Gis called Groups Acting on the Circle. Um, it's a lovely little expository paper. It starts like very gently and ends up very complicatedly. Um, uh, but in particular, it starts very gently. Uh, in L'Enseignement Mathematique, um, and there's lots of beautiful mathematics contained in there. Uh, so I highly recommend. Um, this second half is going to be somewhat disjoint. I will use some of what I talked about uh, before, mostly the definition and properties of rotation number. Um, but if you got lost, you can sort of start over right now. And uh, because, you know, sort of for the first half, I was talking about general properties. What can we prove about theorems generally about groups that act on the circle or about particular homeomorphisms? Here I want to prove not a theorem about all the groups that act and what do they have, but about a particular action of a particular group. Um, so this is the advertised a theorem about surface group automorphism acting on their boundary. And uh, let me start by just describing this. So this is uh, where we are. I want to just draw a different picture of what this action looks like. Okay. Um, so some of you might know that uh, if, say, I put, uh, if um, I take my surface and forget the, it's, its fundamental group for the moment, I want to look at the mapping class group of the surface. Okay, but, uh, but I also want to sort of see what happens to the fundamental group, so I'm going to fix a base point. I, don't, I want things not just up to conjugation, but I want to fix a base point. So this star will be with a marked point. There's a map from uh, mapping classes, homeomorphisms up to isotopy, to uh, automorphisms of the fundamental group, where my fundamental group is now with this base point. Okay. Um, and this is, in fact, an isomorphism onto an index 2 subgroup. And the only reason it's index 2 is we look at mapping classes that preserve orientation. Okay? So this is an isomorphism, what do you do to the fundamental group, onto an index 2 subgroup, which I'll write as ot plus. Um, sitting inside of here, I have inner automorphisms. Okay, that's isomorphic to the surface group itself. Okay, and that inclusion has quotient out. Okay, and what is this surface group sitting inside the mapping class group? Um, this is what's often called the point pushing subgroup. Okay, what do I mean by point push? Uh, here's a piece of my surface, and I have a marked point. Okay, and one thing I could do is I could just like take my finger. Here's something that's isotopically trivial if you didn't require me to fix that point at all times. I could just take my finger and go like push this around a little loop and put it back where I started. Or in other words, in this annulus, I'm going to do something that looks like a sort of a Dane twist here and then a Dane twist on the other side in the opposite direction that will move this transverse curve before to the picture after where it goes like this. Whoop. And that's my marked point. Okay. So I know maybe this was a closed curve you drew. Okay. So that was pushing around the curve. Uh, Gamma in pi 1, where gamma was this thing that I pushed my, uh, my marked point around. It's a based curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you draw as an example where gamma is not uh, simple? Um, 
yep, I mean, it's harder to draw a picture of what happens. But I can tell you what the thing is. You do an isotopy of your surface by pretending your surface is made of a very stretchy material and dragging your point along until it crosses over. Um, so here, how would I point push around? Uh, or I mean, if you really believe that this is a group homomorphism, you can just compose everything out of simple closed curves concatenated and you just compose. But you, yeah, you, this is not what you want. So let's, let's see if I. Uh, what would it look like to point push around? Um, I, I mean, so the point is that if you let, let's do a curve that maybe goes like this and then crosses itself and goes down there. I'll try and point push around that. OK, so in my color scheme from before, I'm supposed to sort of point push around like this in this in this neighborhood. OK, so I have my now my base points over here. It's a new picture. Uh, and I had a transverse thing like this, okay, and, oh, sorry, that's, if I'm going to go this way, I should be on this side of it, uh, sorry, I'll be, yeah, I'll be pushing it along. So I'm going to follow this loop, which will make this curve look like that, okay, and then I'm going to hit here, and I'll see this other piece that I was crossing, right, so this will now get sort of moved along for the ride. I'll have to have nudged this over. And then maybe I'm crossing this image of a white thing again, and it will continue. OK, and then this whole tube of things will end up, this will get nudged up, and it will end up sort of capping off over here with my point. OK. That will be the image of a transverse thing if I loop over myself. I'll do another picture. I'll do another picture slowly. We'll actually mostly care about the picture of what happens on simple closed curves, right? But the point is that if I, if you do this point push, okay, so there's there's that white curve, and then I do another one, say in this curve in this direction, what will it do? It'll it'll now pick up these two little white strands and move them around. Uh, both of them at the same time and come back and you'll see like a doubled up picture of this one okay. So that's what I was trying to draw here you if you cross yourself you see the two strands moved again Okay, okay. Um, So this is a, a famous inclusion here and uh, There's another easy to define map Okay, where you just forget that this point existed. Okay, so any homeomorphism up to isotopy of a surface where isotopies and the homeomorphism have to fix that point defines a homeomorphism up to isotopy not fixing the point called forget that you had to fix the point. So that's a mapping class group. Okay, and this sequence. Uh, is called the Berman exact sequence, studied by Joan Berman. Uh, and the Dane Nielsen Baer theorem is what's telling you that these are isomorphisms. Okay. So, this whole story is just to tell you that if you like mapping classes better than automorphisms of groups, there's a way to see this, and there's a way to see this boundary action. Uh, on d dot plus pi one sigma g. Uh, okay. Uh, and that's as follows. I could fix a hyperbolic structure on my surface. So now its universal cover is the hyperbolic plane. And I can take the, say, the Poincare disk model for the hyperbolic plane as a universal cover. All right. Cool. All right. 
And I'm going to fix also, I have my, my base point for pi 1, my marked point on the surface. I'm going to fix a particular lift of that. That's star, maybe I'll call this guy lift of star. Okay. If I have a homeomorphism of this surface, there is a unique lift of it to a homeomorphism of the universal cover that fixes, if, if my homeomorphism fixes this point, there is a unique lift of it that fixes my chosen lift of the point. So if f of star equals star, there exists a unique lift uh, to a homeomorphism of the hyperbolic plane, fixing the lift of star. And this homeomorphism of the hyperbolic plane induces a homeomorphism of the boundary. And that map on the boundary depends only on this guy up to isotopy fixing the point. So, so only on what f represents in the mapping class group. If I, took a, if I took some other thing that was isotopic to this, I could just lift that isotopy. Okay, my isotopy, because it came from downstairs on a compact surface, it's only going to move points of most distance 25 or something. It moves points of bounded distance. So up here, lifting the isotopy, well, it'll move points around, but each point will move distance at most d, whatever the bound was. Um, in this model, right, the metric makes distance d look smaller and smaller and smaller as you go to the boundary. So I will have moved no points on the boundary <coughs> by performing this isotopy. Okay. So that's why it depends on the, only on the isotopy class of this map. Okay. So what does this say? Uh, this gives you a way to lift mapping classes to homeomorphisms of the boundary of the hyperbolic plane. Okay. So this gives a map from the mapping class group, your surface with a marked point, to homeomorphisms. Here, if I preserve orientation, I'll preserve the orientation of the boundary of the hyperbolic plane, which is the circle. Okay. And under these usual identification, this is the same, this is the same thing. This is the boundary of your group. If you want to think of uh, you know, of your group as the translates of this point under deck transformations. It's a good way to sort of see that these two are the same action. Okay. Okay. So you may, as you prefer, think of this in either way you want. I wanted to put them both out there. Uh, this also sort of gives you a nice way to see what's happening with the push subgroup of the of pi one. Okay, so you can see this directly from the group perspective, or if you see what happens if I push this point around. Okay, well, a uh, uh, one way to do that is I could lift this push. And if I lift the thing supported in this annulus, it'll lift to like you know supporting on a bunch of strips, and it'll move this base point over to the next one. Okay, well that wasn't very good. That broke my rule. I was supposed to choose a lift that fixed uh, the lift of my base point. Okay, so that was the wrong one. I should now post compose with a deck transformation that takes this back to there. Okay, what's that deck transformation? It's exactly, you know, if this was the axis of that curve, that deck transformation is exactly, uh, uh, its boundary action is the boundary action of that isometry coming from this deck transformation. Okay, so that's gamma, and here's its lift. The boundary action of the push subgroup is just the usual action by deck transformations. Okay. So I will record that for posterity here. Okay. 
Okay, so you can think of that as the PSO, if you want, if you put your hyperbolic st structure on your surface, you can think of that as coming from the usual subgroup, dis discrete subgroup of PSL to our defining your surface subgroup acting on the boundary of hyperbolic space. Okay, so here gamma is acting by translating along this axis. So on the boundary, it's got two fixed points and it's moving points. So, in other words, this automorphism of the mapping class group, it's a much bigger group in which I see this surface subgroup uh, acting on the boundary of hyperbolic space. Okay. Um, and I want to talk about a question and its answer. So, here's a question that was in a problems list called problems uh, on mapping class groups, uh, written uh, by Benson and Farb in, I think, 2006. Okay. So he asked, you know, here is, here is a group and a very natural sort of coming from geometry action of this group on a space. It's the boundary of the group. Is this the only way this group acts on its space? So here's the question. Um, suppose you have uh, an embedding, a faithful action of this group on the circle. So I'll call this uh, uh, homomorphism, if you will, from this group to the group of homeomorphisms of the circle. Okay. Oh yeah, and he wanted this to be injective, so a faithful action. And the question is, is, is this the only one there is? So is rho necessarily conjugate to this thing I described here? Let's call it the standard boundary action. That is the statement of the question. Uh, maybe this group has a remarkable property that it only acts on the circle in one way. Okay. Okay. So this statement needs an edit that I think is just a typo. You can, all, you can do something uh, silly to any group acting on the circle. Okay. And this is not just conjugacy, but something called semi-conjugacy. Uh, Yair Minsky's picture of replacing an irrational rotation with this thing where you thicken some points and whatever and you get something that's no longer an irrational rotation, uh, there's an invariant Cantor set, is an example of a semi-conjugacy. In general, you can imagine a picture where if you have a countable group acting on the circle and you look at the orbit of a point, you can just enumerate this orbit, okay, I don't know, x1, x2, x3, whatever, you replace point xi in your circle with a little interval of length, I know, 1 over 2 to the i. Right? That'll give you a bigger circle, diameter 1 bigger, okay? And it tells you how your group is still supposed to act. You permute these intervals, right? Just as you were moving the point. Move 1 to the next by like an affine, the unique affine map. That'll give you an action that's not necessarily conjugate to the original one. If the original one had dense orbits, now this one has, is in like case three, where there's no longer all orbits dense. I have this interval that goes along uh, uh, forming the complement of something that will look like a Cantor set. Okay. So there's a trick that you could do called semi-conjugating that I don't want to worry about too much, but it's how you move between the Cantor set picture and the non-Cantor set picture, you can go back and forth. Okay. Okay. But if you if you if you don't like that picture, you can sort of think conjugate without losing too much of the spirit. Um, uh, and the reason I want to gloss over that part is I want to spend this lecture telling you the answer to the question because it's a good way to showcase some different tools. Um, the answer uh, is a theorem 
that I proved with Maxim Wolf last year. Um, uh, yes, and in fact, even better than this, um, any action of this group on the circle is either uh, semi-conjugate, the best you can hope for, to the picture we just saw, the bound reaction. It looks as best as you can like the group acting on its boundary, or is trivial. Okay. Where Trivial means literally trivial uh, if genus is at least three. And there's another silly way you could be trivial in genus two. Um, in when g equals two, the abelianization of this group is a finite cyclic group. It's a z mod 10 z. It happens to be, I think that's a theorem of Berman. Um, so you could map to the abelianization, and then you're like a cyclic group of order 10, you could act by a rotation. Mm -hmm. So for g equals 2, you can factor. It is non-trivial to show that the abelianization is that. Uh, OK. So. Uh, Yeah, so this theorem says that it's either injective or it's badly, badly non-injective. It's trivial or factors through a finite group. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I want to just spend this whole time sort of outlining all the steps in the proof because it shows you how to use a bunch of the basic techniques that we used before. Okay. Uh, this is one of those things where you prove a theorem and you find a very complicated way to do it and you're like, yes, we answered a hard question with a hard proof. And then you're like, well, that step could be easier. And you sort of clean it up and you're like, oh, that only is like a very basic fact. And then you're like, well, what about step two? Like, oh, actually, you know what? That wasn't so bad either. And, uh, and at the end, it's something that like, you know, is, a, I think, appropriate for this mini course and a good way to teach people about how to, how to understand groups that act on the circle. OK, so let's prove it. Okay. And I mean, the point is you don't need to know a lot to get started. What do we have? I have a mystery action of a group on the circle. And I want to uh, show that it's not so mysterious. It's either extremely boring, or it's one that we can understand as much as we want. It's the group acting on its boundary. OK, so that's my setup. Suppose. And I'm going to assume the genus is at least three, so I don't have to worry about two different cases. I'll point my finger at the one place at the very end where we're going to actually use that assumption. OK. So I'll assume genus at least three, but I don't need to use that until the end. Um, and I have some mystery action of this automorphism group on the circle. And the goal of the first two parts here, the first part is, OK, well, this group is big and complicated, but there's something I know that sits inside it. There's that inner automorphism group. There's the surface subgroups. And I know very well what I'm aiming to show that action looks like. Right? I want to prove, to prove this theorem, I want to prove that it's either the usual deck transformation action, it's looking like that, or it's totally trivial. So let's study the surface subgroup first. OK. So the restriction of rho to my surface group. <coughs> okay. that, that's the inner, the inner automorphism subgroup. Okay. And what I need to prove some facts. I'm going to try and prove some facts about this. 
that show it looks either like it's trivial or it's like the usual one. Okay. Well, one property shared both by the completely trivial everyone's the identity action and the usual boundary action is that these push or deck transformation, have, they all have fixed points. In PSL2R, they're all hyperbolic uh, transformations. And in the trivial action, they're trivial. Okay. So our first lemma is to say that, hey, like that's, that's true even under the mystery one. Uh, and how do I say something has a fixed point? Well, it's a fact that you have a fixed point if and only if the rotation number is zero. So that rotation number we defined before picks out uh, whether you have, uh, whether points move at all or not. Okay. So lemma one is that if, uh, let's do it for nice curves, if gamma in pi one sigma g represents a non-separating, so I don't want it to cut my surface in half, simple closed curve, okay. then well, gamma is supposed to act on the circle in some way, that's some homeomorphism of the circle, the lemma says its rotation number is zero. That's certainly true for things that do nothing and for hyperbolic, for, for the usual boundary action. Okay. Um, all right. All right, and I'm going to prove the lemma by looking at what happens in the mapping class group. So this is where I need to use this picture. In the mapping class group, gamma, my push around gamma, oh good, this was the nice picture where it's a non-separating simple closed curve. Okay. <coughs> I'll draw another version of it here, so there's my gamma. And the thing that takes, that's supported on this annulus and takes the, this white curve here, the one that just goes around to the one I drew, okay, is equal to the composition of two Dane twists a usual drain twist in this curve on this side of my marked point, and then a Dane twist in the opposite direction in this curve. Right. A usual Dane twist in this curve takes this arc to something that looks like, uh, right? And then one going the opposite way will take the other half of this arc to one that looks like, uh, like the mirror image of this. Uh, so like this around and then here. And that's exactly the picture I had drawn there. Okay, so the point is that I can write gamma in the mapping class group, which is the, the automorphism group of my surface group, as the composition of two Dane twists, let's call it twist one, and twist two, where the direction of twist two is the opposite. Okay, so I'll pretend twist two is going the usual way, but I'll write it with an inverse. Okay. And in the mapping class group, these Dane twists around simple non-separating, simple closed curves are conjugate. Okay. Where T1 conjugate to, to tau2. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now here's where I just want to use facts about rotation numbers. Uh, so these are conjugate. Uh, oh, and there's, I guess, another fact I want to use. These are supported on disjoint little annuli, right? My two blue curves were, didn't cross. So from what we know about mapping class groups is that T1 and T tau2 commute. Okay, so now let's try and study uh, what this looks like for rotation numbers. So that means rho of gamma is rho of t1, t2 inverse, which is rho of t1, rho of t2. This is a group action composed with rho of t2 inverse. Great. And so the rotation number of this circle homeomorphism is equal to the rotation number of these because they're the same thing. 
Uh, oh, but they commute, and rotation number is a homomorphism on abelian subgroups exercise. So this is the sum of these two. Oh, I don't know why I switched to a color. Uh, and this is a group action, so or, or this is a homomorphism, a representation, so I can put the inverse out there. Uh, oh, and homogeneity of rotation number means the rotation number of the inverse of something is the minus of its rotation number. So I can take this minus and it move it over here. Okay. Um, so that was homogeneity. And now what else do I have? Oh, I have conjugacy invariance that was also on my list of properties that follows easily from the definition. So uh, this number and this number are equal because these two elements are conjugate. They're conjugate in your group, so in particular they're conjugate as homeomorphisms of the circle. So this is zero. They just completely cancel um, by conjugacy invariance. And that's the proof of the lemma. So just by using things I know about rotation number and mapping class groups, uh, we already have a good step along the way to this looks like how it should. Um, this argument doesn't work because your Dane twist won't be conjugate. And I don't need to know that yet. So, uh, I mean, the answer is yes, because the theorem is true. But uh, I don't have a three-line argument that does it. OK, okay. Uh, great. Next lemma. Uh, so I'm sneaking this in because I wanted to define a very important uh, in, uh, uh, tool in studying groups acting on the circle. And this is the, the bounded Euler class. Um, and I'm going to give you a very hands-on definition of what this is. So let me state step number two, or lemma two, which is another statement that's going to say, in a fancy way, that this has some property either in common with the trivial action or the usual boundary one. Okay. Uh, so I'll use a word we haven't defined yet. The Euler number E of this action of a surface group okay, is either zero, this is what the trivial action would give you, or up to sign the Euler characteristic of your surface, 2g minus 2. This is what the usual boundary action would have. And now I will tell you what this Euler number means. Okay. So postpone proof for a definition. And I'm going to give you not the usual definition. Um, so you may have not, even if you've heard this word before, you may have not heard it. But I, one I particularly like, and actually I learned it out of a, uh, this way of thinking of it. Um, uh, out of a paper of Anna Wienhard uh, on, on the higher tech Buhler theory of all things, where they study actions of surface groups. So this is, you know, I'm sure other people have shared this perspective, um, uh, but that's where I happen to learn it. Okay. Um, so this definition is for an action of an, of an arbitrary action of a surface group on the circle. Okay. Suppose have so forget I was this row from before, just some other row action of a surface group on the circle. Okay. All right, I'm going to take a pants decomposition of, your, of my surface. Just pick any one you want for now. And I'm going to say, what does each pant contribute? And I'm going to sum them all up. Okay. So for a pant, 
Okay, here's my pants. Okay, so there's my pair of pants. Uh, its boundary curves represent elements of the fundamental group. And if my base point was in here, going around this, oh shoot, I should orient this this way. So it's the induced orientation from my surface, uh, from the pants. So this is like a curve that goes like this and comes back. And this boundary is like a curve that goes like this and comes back. Let's call this guy A, this guy B. And then my induced orientation here is this way, right? Uh, yes. And so this last boundary component, I'm just trying to write its boundary as elements of the fundamental group if my base point were here. This boundary component is now going to be what I should do B inverse followed by A inverse. I'll write it like function composition. Okay, so those are its boundary components. All right. And the Euler number of, for the pant is going to measure how badly rotation number fails to be a homomorphism on this pant. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, I don't understand your yes. picture. So your right curve? Yes. But what is the... Uh, so I have my pants on the surface. Right. And I just want to, here's my pants. I just want to say, forget I drew a base point. I want to say, I want to say, what are the boundaries of my pant in this in the fundamental group? Okay, so if this is a and that's b, that's a inverse times b inverse. Okay. My computation was I had to draw a base point and be like, all right, going around this loop is like I go over here and then I go around and then I go around the back and then I go back. I'm just I'm I'm slow and I always get orientations wrong, so I was just drawing it very carefully. But the, infor uh, the information to record is that this, 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 what I've written down. Okay. So I'll steal some space over here. Actually, I guess I can go over to this board. Lots of space. Um, I want to measure how much rotation number is not a homomorphism on the pant. So the Euler number, the pant part, P, um, of rho, I define to be um, the rotation number of the action of A plus the rotation number of the action of B minus, uh, sorry, I'm just going to sum over all uh, the boundaries. So plus the rotation number of rho uh, B composed with rho, so I want literally that boundary on A inverse, rho B inverse. Okay. And if you like, if it's sort of nicer to you to understand it this way, right, this is the inverse of B composed with A, so this you could think of as minus rotation number of rho B composed with rho A, if you liked. Yes. Why is this independent of your choice of pants? Well, we're not, I haven't even told you that you have to sum them up yet, but yes. Okay, that's one of your exercises, is to show by elementary pants moves that my definition is going to be independent of choice of pants. All right, but there's another problem I have to fix here. Right, these are all things mod z, and I actually want to get a real number. So I'm going to just lift these like we did to the line and take their lifted rotation numbers. Okay, and so then I'll take the lift of this, I'll take its inverse, I'll take the lift I chose, I'll take the inverse of that, and I'll look at this composition. And here it's easy to check on this level that the number you get here is independent of choice of lifts. If I move this by an integer translation, I change its inverse by an integer translation in the opposite direction. So I would add one and I'd minus one. So this thing I, is, I've got is well defined. And this up to mod z is measuring the failure of this guy to be a homomorphism. Okay. So this is no longer part of the definition. Motivation. Okay, and so then here's the part that you're like, why is this not depending on pants? Uh, I define the Euler number of rho to be sum over all p in my pants decomposition. Okay. Of the 
contribution from the pan. Okay. And exercise, doable by changing pants one at a time, is this is independent of the pants decomposition. And if you don't like that, <coughs> there's another exercise which is prove that this is the same as this other number. And the other number, it has no reference to pants whatsoever. It was something you could just sort of produce out of nowhere. Okay. Okay. But here is a very concrete thing that takes you, you let's, you know, I'm, I like this version because it's very concrete. You can choose whichever pants decomposition you like, and you're just looking at rotation numbers of some nice, simple closed curves. Okay. Um, and a fact that comes out of the quasi-morphism property I said. Okay, so this was actually basically on our list of properties before, is that this number is bounded uh, in absolute value by one. Okay. So this is a property I called before called quasi-morphism. Uh, and if you permit me a second of digression, this actually, this statement, the, what I called fact, uh, is really part of a famous theorem in mathematics. This is the Milner-Wood inequality. Hinges is a statement about Euler numbers, or it's really a statement about like uh, Euler classes of flat bundles. Um, and it boils down to this observation once you frame everything in the right way. That is just to say that there's some kind of uh, interesting math hidden in here. Okay, so let's see what I can extract. Uh, let's go back. So I gave you all the definitions. It was just a statement about rotation numbers that added up. Um, and the claim is that this is either zero or this uh, Euler characteristic looking thing. Okay. So let's prove the lemma. All right, and uh, at least to sketch it. Uh, so I can choose whatever pants decomposition I want after you do your homework. Uh, and I'm going to choose one that looks like this, like a really nice looking one. This is my surface. I'll draw it in kind of a round way. And I'll put pants curves like this. All right, so that all my pants look the same. Okay, there's like a rotation or a, like a reflection that moves one to the other. In fact, you can prove that even in the based mapping class group, there is something that takes the triple of curves bounding one of these pants to any other one of these pants triples. Okay, so my mapping class group moves these around. Okay. And you see I also cooked it up so that all of the boundaries are non-separating simple closed curves. So we're going to pick this pants decomposition. Pick these P's. Okay. Now, what do I know? If I try and understand the Euler number of one of these pants, okay, it's a sum of rotation numbers. I knew something about rotation numbers. That was from lemma one. If I have non-separating simple closed curves, then they get the number zero. So their lifts are, I don't know, they're some integers, right? Everything is just like zero mod z. All right, so that's great. This is something that's zero mod z. So that's zero mod z by lemma one. And our fact, or what I said was some famous theorem called the Milner-Wood inequality says that uh, this number that's zero mod z, there's only three options. It's one or minus one or zero. Okay. So it's actually equal to one or plus or minus one or zero by the quasi-morphism fact. Okay. So that's something that's uh, true for individual pants. All right. And there's a little work to do, but the fact that I chose these all so that 
uh, there was some element of some homeomorphism of your surface that I can think of as a mapping class or as an automorphism of pi 1 that took any one of these pants to any one of the other ones. Like if I want to go through there, I should just like rotate the whole thing around like this. Okay. Tells me that these are the same. I get the same number on each pair of pants. Right. Conjugating by that homeomorphism uh, tells me that I should conjugate rotation numbers and they don't change. So every pant here can be taken to every other by an automorphism or a mapping class. Okay. And rotation number is conjugacy invariant. So you get the same value. on each pant. All right, so I'm just summing up the same number uh, how many times? Uh, how many pants in a pants decomposition? 2g minus 2 many. Uh, so I get 0 times 2g minus 2 or plus minus 1 times 2g minus 2 Okay, for the total. I'm going to switch uh, these boards a little bit. Great. Okay, so we sort of accomplished our first goal here, which was studying what happens with the surface group. That was still a setup for my proof. So I'll keep that there. Okay. Okay, so the reason this Euler number, I just told you some recipe that you don't even believe me is well defined because it depends on the pants comp decomposition, except I swore to you that you didn't. Uh, this number that takes, it takes an action of a group on the circle, and the surface group, mind you, and spits out a number um, uh, is, is an amazingly rich invariant. Uh, and here's one theorem that I'm going to quote uh, that tells you uh, how much it just knows. Okay, so if we're in the case where the surface group, uh, the Euler number of your action of the surface group, the one I was thinking of, the one we had, but this is true for any action of a surface group, if it agrees with the Euler characteristic of your surface, it turns out that's as big as it can possibly be. Okay. Then there's a theorem. So oh, maybe I should state this is the theorem. Okay. And this is due to Mats Matsumoto, Shigenori Matsumoto, from about 1990, I want to say. Um, he proved that this number tells you what the action looks like in the case where it is the Euler characteristic. Then this action is, you guessed it, the standard boundary action. Okay. So it is semi-conjugate to the usual And somehow secretly what's going on in his proof of this is he wants to kind of recover where, you know, he wants to recover the fact that you were a surface acting on a surface group acting like by deck transformations on the boundary of hyperbolic space. And he uses kind of ping pong-ish arguments to say that when I had, you know, like 
elements of my fundamental group that correspond to like curves in your surface that crossed and played ping pong, then the fact that this number is really big means that they'd have to play ping pong on the surface and so that it's like they had crossed axes. And he sort of rebuilds the surface out of this. Okay. It's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful theorem. Okay. But I'm just going to quote it and be like, look, in half the cases we're basically already done. All right. So it's not super hard to go from this. This is the surface group. This is the inner automorphisms. It's a normal subgroup using the fact that this is a normal subgroup in my automorphism group. It's easy to show that if this guy's acting in the usual way, then actually the whole group has to come along for the ride and be acting in the usual way too. Okay. Uh, all of wrote, not just the restriction to this normal subgroup, but the whole thing is the usual bound reaction. Boundary. Okay. Imagine for a minute that uh, it was actually genuinely conjugate, not semi-conjugate. Then this means that everyone in pi one sigma g is acting with like, uh, you know, source sync dynamics with a with an attracting fixed point and a repelling fixed point. Automorphisms of the group have to, it's, you know, an automorphism will send some element of fundamental group to another one. So I know where this point, where its attracting point went. It went to the attracting point of its image under that automorphism. That's enough to determine what you do, I guess, on a dense set, all of the attracting points. So that determines what your whole action is. And that's the kind of argument you use here. Okay. Okay, so we just won. Yay. Okay. All right, so we only have one more thing to do, and then we've proved a whole theorem, right? We want to know that if I get zero, then my action is trivial. Okay. If the Euler number then trivial. All right, and this, uh, for this, I'm just going to enlarge my surface group a little bit. My surface subgroup, the inner automorphisms, sits in f f as f a finite index subgroup of some slightly bigger group of automorphisms, um, which I can realize as the fundamental group of an or a hyperbolic orbifold, if you like. Okay. Uh, and specifically, um, for this, I'm going to study instead. A subgroup of um, that I'll call delta. Okay. And I claim there's one that has the following presentation. Um, it's going to look like uh, a, the fundamental group of something that's a sphere with four cone points. So I'm going to get all geometric topology on you for a second, so hang on for the ride, uh, of order 2, 2, 2, and 2G. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, I'm going to write down a presentation for it. So this is generated by four things, uh, where a squared equals b squared equals c squared equals d to the 2G equals the product of all of them. And these are all just trivial. Those are your relations. <coughs> Okay, so this you can show sits in this automorphism group. You can think of it as coming from special finite order symmetries of your surface if you write your surface in a particularly nice geometric way. Um, and it really is a finite extension of the surface group. It's search, uh, sorry, uh, it contains the surface group with finite index. Um, you can write a surjection of this group to the dihedral group with four G elements that has as kernel um, <coughs> uh, 
a surface subgroup. Okay, so this is one way to show that you can realize uh, this group is a group of automorphisms. Okay. Um, I can write down exactly what this surjection is, but I don't know if it's super enlightening. I need to send A to some element of order 2, so if my dihedral group's generally generated by like an S and an R, this is going to S. This order 2 G1 is going to R, and these go to other reflections that you cook up so that they're uh, uh, their product is the identity. All right, so you can press me to write down exactly this before, but trust me, we've worked at the details. This is, uh, this contains a surface subgroup with finite index. Okay. And the point is uh, that groups of this form, okay, also get Euler numbers, and the Euler number is multiplicative under covers. If you're good at orbifolds and orbifold fundamental groups, uh, uh, this is a sphere with four special points, so its fundamental group has A and B and C and D are corresponding to loops around these points. Okay. I can make a pants decomposition of this guy by slicing it like here, and use the same kind of recipe to get an Euler number. Okay. So if you don't like that explanation, you can just accept as fact that Euler number applies to, with the same kind of formula, to actions of these kind of groups too. Um, uh, and we'll take a value here that is a multiple given by the index of, uh, of the Euler number of, on the surface group. Okay. Now, rotation number definition just tells you that it is, if I think of these as my pants and loops around these as my generators, then uh, it's going to be of the form rotation number of row A plus rotation number of row B. That's for like two of the pants, and then here's where they match up. Uh, so I'll get a rotation number of row of C and a rotation number of row of D. And I didn't take any lifts or anything, so this is just like plus some integer is the best I can say. But it's always of this kind of form. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it is of the form this. All right. From the same kind of definition. Uh, great. Okay. So let's see. I know some things about these guys. Namely, this is order two, and that's order two, and that's order two. Okay, and so these all have to look like literally rotations of order two. So this, oh, let's circle with the color. This and this and this are all elements. They're all half integers. Okay, or maybe they're zero or whatever, but they're all in half z. And I guess this one is too. It's an integer. It's also in half z. So the only way that this guy is supposed to be a multiple of this, what I'm in the remaining case where this guy, where this is supposed to be zero, I know that zero is equal to some half integer plus, I guess, the rotation number of rho of d, whatever that's doing. Okay. Well, uh, this implies that the rotation number of rho of d must also be a half integer. And since D was finite order, it's acting by some finite order homeomorphism of the circle. Those are all rotations. Okay. So if it's a rotation, if it looks like a rotation with rotation number, some multiple of a half, it's either an order two rotation or it's trivial. Right? But in particular, if I do it twice, 
I'll have done nothing. Okay, so using the fact that I know I'm finite order, this improves me to I'm actually a finite, I'm actually an order two. Okay. All right, and now we're done. Okay, by the following fun exercise, basically every finite order mapping class, like d squared, for example, here, here, or finite order automorphism of a service group, here d squared is finite order, it's order g. Okay. Uh, they norm it normally generates the whole mapping class group or automorphism group. So here's your end of the proof exercise. D squared, its normal closure, or it normally generates. Uh, Ought, or you can write mapping class. Maybe I'll write mapping class because it's more suggestive for how I think about proving it. So what did I find? I found something that normally generates the whole guy in the kernel of my action row, so the whole thing must just be trivial. And that is how you uh, end the proof, modulo exercise. All right. so. That was a lot, uh, but I wanted to sort of outline how one goes about proving a whole theorem uh, using some of these techniques like rotation number. Um, and uh, this particular exercise is not on your sheet because it's about mapping classes, not about circle homeomorphisms. But if you like mapping classes better than that, I won't be offended if you decide to prove this one. Um, thank you.